what makes Fire Emblem Genealogy of the Holy War unique. Ever since Fire Emblem Awakening's record-breaking sales, the Fire Emblem fanbase has grown to new, unfound popularity. However, it's easy to forget how the series dates back all the way to the NES and had six Japan-only titles before making its first worldwide release. Although most of these titles are obsolete nowadays, one stands out for really trying to take the series in a different direction. On May 14, 1996, Nintendo and Intelligent Systems released Fire Emblem Seisen no Keifu to the Super Famicom. Known in English as Genealogy of the Holy War, it was the fourth title in the series. Produced by the legendary Gunpei Okoi, to which was his last ever video game, the title aimed to expand the scope of the franchise and introduce many new features that later would define this monumental series. What makes Genealogy of the Holy War unique is how it builds on the Fire Emblem framework by broadening the series' established formula, while introducing dynamic, new features that later would become a big focus of the franchise. The game stars Sigurd, the Prince of Chalfi Castle in the Central Kingdom of Grandvale. Although most of the Yggdral continent is peaceful, on one fateful day, the nearby Kingdom of Verdain takes opportunity to invade Grandvale while their superiors were off investigating another kingdom. Sigurd takes charge in order to push back the invasion, but of course, once the politics begin to break down, there is much darker reasoning behind this attack. These opening bits are all slowly explained in just the prologue chapter of the game, as Sigurd already begins recruiting many friends and allies to help push back the Verdane invaders. This is where the game begins to differ from other Fire Emblem titles. Along with the prologue and final chapter, there is only a mere 10 chapters in the game. Though this is far short of the average 25 chapters in future installments, Genealogy of the Holy War makes each chapter exceedingly longer by having multiple objectives scattered around a gigantic map. Within the prologue alone, Sigurd meets up with many of his comrades and speaks with many enemies, whereas normally the prologue is just a tutorial. Because of the size of these maps, the feeling of being part of a war is heavily established throughout the gameplay, and when players see the overworld map in between chapters, they can visually understand where they traveled, giving the game a sense of scale. With the larger maps, Sigurd needs a bigger army compared to other lords in the series, and unlike later installments, no unit is ever left behind. These characters are recruited in a similar fashion to other titles, all with their own class, backstories, and, for the first time in the series, skills. This was the first title in which the class skill system was used to such an extreme. Every class is given their skills, and every character also has their own personal skill. Although not as polished as later titles, this makes genealogy feel very recognizable to even modern fans of the series. Knowing which characters offer certain strengths and weaknesses in combat makes the strategy dynamic. With the larger maps and multiple castles, finding a balance between advancing towards the next castle while defending old ones makes for a familiar but more extreme take to the series. During this combat, as the characters fight together, they begin to create relationships with one another, and during the Holy Wars, do these relationships truly feel like they matter? The support system in Fire Emblem has slowly evolved into the affectionately called waifu simulator that it is today, but it was genealogy that introduced the romanticism. Being literally referred to as a love system, male and female characters that stand adjacent to each other will slowly grow affection for one another. There are still the staple support conversations that can affect this growth as well, luckily. Outside of related or already married characters, any pairing is possible among the player's army. When characters reach the required number of love points to become married, they can begin to share resources and get random critical hits when standing near each other. Because of the more structured inventory system, being able to share money shows the importance of these relationships. Of course, much like the aforementioned waifu simulator, marriage leads to children. However, unlike today's titles, it actually plays into the story. At the end of Chapter 5, Sigurd's army is ambushed in what is referred to as the Belhalla Massacre. Right as it seems like the lead characters are defeated, Sigurd's son, Selif, takes the reins as the leader of the rebellion, and then proceeds to round up all the descendants of Sigurd's army and defeat the new threat of the Loptirians. This single-handedly makes the whole children aspect feel much more impactful to the story. Along with skills and stats being passed on by their fathers, children also get the items held by their parents if they are capable to use them. Even siblings can get random critical hits in a similar fashion to married couples. Managing characters, items, and these relationships just adds so much complexity to the series as well as giving the characters their personality. This is why later installments all focused on having some form of support system to help grow the characters and give the team more stories to share. 
With the gigantic maps and the need to use every unit in Sigurd's and Celis' army, the importance of character management is a huge focus. While managing to balance the strategic elements as well as the love and marriage plans, the game feels different compared to all other installments. Fire Emblem veterans will enjoy planning out pairings and the skills for the children, but even casual fans can enjoy the fresh feeling of large-scale combat, and watching the story unfold over the course of a chapter, rather than having story mainly told between chapters. Although now over 20 years old, and definitely archaic by today's standards as it lacks many of the simpler features, Genealogy of the Holy War stands out as probably the most extreme shift in design to the Fire Emblem framework. Its sequel, Thracia 776, plays more like the GBA titles and thus looks more like the series today. So both in the prequel and the sequel did the series make new changes, making this title seem like the odd one out. Although marriage in Fire Emblem is hotly debated about being forced into the series, when broken down and built around the plot, it definitely feels more in tune with the gameplay. That is what makes Fire Emblem Genealogy of the Holy War unique. If you enjoyed this video, click that like button, and if you'd like to see more videos that discuss what makes any video game stand out, be sure to subscribe. Thanks for watching.